Well, guys, would you grab hold of a Bible and make your way to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 5 is where we're going to be this morning as we dive into the scriptures. We're continuing our verse-by-verse study in the book of 1 John uh, that we've been doing. have been out of for a couple weeks. We're glad to be back there this morning and de- be moving through that. And so inviting you to be there. Hopefully you bought a, brought a Bible. If you didn't, there are Bibles around you in the chairs uh, in front of you there where you can grab hold of a Bible, page number on the screen where you could get there rapidly. Uh, we'd invite you to do that. You can use an electronic device if you want. One way or another, we're inviting you to have the scriptures so that you're following with us. If you're joining us online, you're joining us uh, in the overflow, we just give you the same invitation. We just want you to be there with us, to be in the word of God with us. So we're inviting you to have a copy of the scriptures, opening it up, longing that God would take his word, his truth, and just meet each of us this morning in just a significant and real way. So with that as an invitation, a desire that it would be so, Would you join me right now? Let's just take a moment and ask God that he would do that, that he'd open up his word to you, to me, that he'd speak to us. I'm going to lead in that prayer, but I'm hoping you would pray as well, that God would just make this known to you this morning, his truth that he has for each one of us. So let's ask him. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have given to us that which is true. Jesus, I think about what you told us, that heaven and earth would pass away, but your word, would never pass away. Everything else can shake. Everything else can move. This doesn't change. Thank you that that's true. Thank you that there's hope in you. Thank you what you tell us there in in, in Psalm 119, that your word is the light to us. It is the light unto our path. God, would you make it so today? Would you shine your truth into our lives that both gives us understanding, but draws us to what you have for us? Would you do what I cannot do? Would you open up your truth to us in a way that is personal, is real, and very applicational right where we are, is effective in helping us right now where we are? God, would you do more than I could ask, more than I can think, more than any of us can? Would you meet us here? Would you give us ears to hear what your spirit would speak to us now? We ask for that together, and we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we open with a question. The question is found in verse 5 at the very beginning of it. You have your passage there. You might just notice it. Chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Who is he who overcomes the world? Hey, that's a good question for us to pause right now. It's as if he looks and says, Who is it? Who's the one that overcomes? Who's the one that is that? And this morning, I get to draw you to that question, but in the midst of it. I get to draw you to this incredible reality and even this amazing word. See, I use the word, or it uses, God uses the word here, overcome in our passage. And it's an amazing word. I find myself wondering if you already know it so. If this morning, if you hear this, and already you're like, oh yeah, just just the word reminds me of it. Because this word is roving throughout the New Testament into a reality of things that God has for us, where he calls us to this space of overcoming. Now, we're going to dive into that here because he speaks about it in these two verses in a very powerful way. But before we do that, let's just give it a quick definition. So the English word overcome is used here in our text. It's taken from a Greek word because the New Testament was originally written in Greek, which is the word nikao. And it's translated in the New Testament in a number of different ways. You would find uh, the idea of overcoming or overcame. Sometimes it's translated conquer or conquering. Sometimes it's translated victory, sometimes prevailed, but it is this reality that is drawing us there. It is a word that always in all of those places is calling us to see something of a victory, to see something of a victorious prevailing over something. It's as if you would look at an adversary, maybe a a war that was being fought or a or or even just a, a sports contest that would be being played, and then you would look and say, so who won? I mean, who's, who's going to be the victor on the other side of it? And this word, nakao, is used for that, for that person who, at the end of that day, on the other side of the battle, at the other side of maybe that sports contest, is standing there in the victor circle as the victor, as the, as the conqueror, as the winner, as the one who is that. And that's how it's used for us. Now, some of you might even find this helpful, I don't know, but that was a, con- a concept that was very 
real within the Greek culture. They uh, had the idea of, of the god Nike that would be there, and so it kind of even worked its way, and some of you might even be wearing one this morning. If you have one of those Nike tennis shoes on with that little, you know, Nike symbol on it, you may or may not know it was a symbol for victory. It was, in a sense, to say, hey, we are declaring, we are saying, hey, we're going to be victorious. We're going to be the winners. We're going to be the one on the other side of this. So they would have understood that in ways that maybe you didn't or don't, but I want to draw you into it because there's something about this word that is to have that resounding feel. It's the one who wins. It's the one who's victorious. It's the one who on the other side of whatever that there comes out on top, comes out victorious on the other side of that, and that's where he's speaking to us. That's this word overcome, and all by itself, it can just be huge. John has already used it a couple times here in 1 John, but in our verses this morning, we're going to cover two verses, but he uses the word four times. Four times in these two verses, he speaks it. Why don't you notice it with me? You got your Bibles hopefully there. Chapter 5, verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory. Quick pause. The word victory is nikao. It's just used in a different tense, but it's the idea of overcoming as well. So this is our overcoming, or this is our victory. That has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who has overcome the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, in the midst of this, he's going to unpack this for us. Show us four times that we're going to see this reality, and yet three main kind of just truths that are meant to kind of explode across us this morning, and I hope they do. Hope in a way it just speaks life, maybe things you already know, but maybe things you need to hear in a fresh way. And so we begin with it at the first part of verse 4 again. First time he uses this, he says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. The idea of this overcoming here is saying everybody who is that, everybody who is born of God will Everybody who's a part of that, everybody who's in that is that, and every Christian who's really a Christian is born of God, is born again. That's the way Jesus defined it. Some of you would know it well in that passage where Jesus kind of talks to Nicodemus in John 3. He begins to explain it, and he answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nobody goes to heaven any other way. The only way to go into the kingdom of God, the only way to be a part of what God does, is to be born again. And that becomes this definition of what it is to be a Christian. Where it tells us in Corinthians, old things have passed away, all things have become new. That to become a Christian, it's not just being religious. It's being changed by God, being transformed by Him. And again, I like the way it's referred to even in our text, for it says it there in verse 4, whatever is born of God. That is that God has caused this birth to happen, that it's flowing out of who he is. And again, it's a definition of what a Christian is. Now, maybe you're here this morning, and that's not true of you. Maybe you're here, maybe you're even religious. Well, I just want to tell you that's not going to work, because Jesus is saying the only one who's going to get there is to be born again. And if you have not been born again, if you have not entered into a relationship with Jesus where he transforms and makes you new, then we plead with you today to give your life to Jesus. We plead with you to to cry out to him and be born again, and we give you that invitation this morning. That said, for many of you, probably even most of you, you have been. You are in that, and you come into this understanding that I'm drawing you to see it, that when we use the idea of born again, we're not talking about a segment of Christians but all Christians. In other words, again, there's not like, okay, there's like the normal Christian, and then there's the born-again Christian, as if somehow that were like super spiritual or something, and sometimes people would say it that way, but biblically, no. There's only one kind of Christian, and that's a born-again Christian, and so if you are a believer this morning, you know Jesus, then that is you, and this passage then speaks to you and says, everyone who is born of God, you know, you, you're, you're that, and Each and every Christian, therefore, will overcome. Well, again, that's how he says it. So I want you to notice it there in the first part of verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Just focus on that word whatever for a moment. The idea is really intensive in the Greek language. It has the idea of every single one. 
Each and every single one that is born of God overcomes the world. Not some of them, not just part of them, not just held out as hope. Every single one does. Every single one that is in that space of that has that. Now, this is really, really good because right now this helps us. Because, again, I know I'm speaking to many of you. You know Jesus, and you might even have a propensity to hear what I'm saying and kind of think, Oh, good for them. You know, I'm glad there are some overcomers. You know, I don't think that really defines me. Well, you're wrong. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're an overcomer. You are. We are going to overcome this world. We are going to overcome this world because each and every Christian, therefore, has that destiny. Destiny that Jesus is going to take us to heaven, that the world isn't going to win, that there's a future for us and that which is laid out for us, and he's inviting us to think about that and know that reality. I found myself thinking about that, and uh, just the, the whole way that works out, it's interesting. In the last book of the Bible, it's the book of Revelation that unpacks a lot of the things at the end. If you're familiar with the book of Revelation, you would know in chapters 2 and 3, there are seven letters that Jesus dictates uh, to the church. In one sense, he speaks to the entire church in all generations, but every one of those letters ends with a familiar and consistent just declaration and invitation. He would end every letter just saying, to him who overcomes, I will give. And I just want to tell you right here, that's not talking to a segment of believers, but to all believers. Saying, if you're really a good, if you're really a Christian, I have this for you. And every promise there in chapter 2 and 3 that ends that way is for all believers, which is an amazing reality. And so that begins that way in the book of Revelation. Then you fast forward to the end of it in chapter 21, and it says this, Then he who sat on the throne, speaking of God, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. God's going to fix it. He's going to take this broken world, and he's going to make it right. Everything that is broken about it, all pain, sorrow, suffering, is over. As Revelation 21 just begins, he says it's all new. It's all fresh. There's this brand new world that is, has no brokenness, has no more pain, no more sorrow, no more any of that. He says, I want you to know this is true. Like You could trust this. And then he simply says this. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. That reality is true for every Christian. It says if you're one of the ones who are overcoming, if you're one of those ones who have overcome in Jesus, then you're, all of this is yours. All of this is yours. And, and God will be your God. You will be his child, this incredible reality that's laid out for us. And so he's inviting you and I to th- see that that we would gaze into this this morning and we would just begin with this understanding when we think about the word overcoming, it is a definition of every Christian. Because we will. We will. In fact, I I like the phrase that says it this way, that it says, I know how the story ends. Now, I I, I found that phrase very specifically helpful in in a worship song that we're going to share with you at the end of the service. We're going to be, it's going to be the first time we've sung it. Uh, we'll sing it as our last song this morning, but I kind of want to even just begin introducing it now. It was written by Shane and Shane this year. And so as the, really the war began to break out in Ukraine and all the turmoil was happening in the world and kind of the refugee crisis was there and, and just the angst and the agony and, and the struggle over uh, many of our brothers and sisters suffering, you know, Shane Shane sat down to, to, to write this song, and it just kind of just has this idea of considering how God has already won. And it will go on in the, in the song that we'll sing. Uh, it, it's part of the refrain. It just simply says it this way. I know how the story ends. You know, we will be with you again. You know, I, I know where this is going. I, I, I know what's happening. You're my savior. You're my defense. No more fear in life or death. I just want to tell you, this is an incredible reality. It's a song that I uh, enjoyed the moment I, I heard it, and it has met me in incredible ways in this season, and I long for it to be something that speaks to you and yet invite you to be able to say that, that you would be able to look at this, and here's the truth. We know how this ends. You know, if you're a follower of Jesus, no matter what's happening in our world today, no matter what's happening in your life, the, the end is not uncertain for us. 
We're not sitting here going, well, I hope it really works out, you know. I hope something, it's like, no, I know where this ends. I, I know what Jesus has done. I know the end of the story. I can read the end of the book. I know where this is going. I might not understand the chapter we're in right now, but I know this doesn't end here. I, I know this doesn't end here. So when the word overcoming speaks to us, it invites us to see that, to say, you know what? There's a day coming when I'm going to stand victorious when I'll be in the winner's circle as it was. There in heaven going, we won. The world is over. Like pain, sorrow, and suffering is defeated. Loss is no more. We're there. We are overcomers. We are that one who gets to live that. And all by itself, if you just believed that, you would be helped. If you solidly believe when you hear the word overcomer that you would know, I am that's where we're going. That's what's before us. That's the reality that's there. Well, we begin there, and he begins to unpack that for us. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but let's go to the second thing he tells us about overcoming, also found in verse 4. I'll just begin at the beginning. It says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. That's what we just talked about. Second sentence, and this is the victory, or this is the overcoming, that has overcome the world, our faith. This is the thing that helps us overcome now because we overcome. There is this sense that we look at this, and he tells us you know, twice in this one sentence, this place of overcoming, that overcome, that since we overcome, we can overcome. And he tells us how. He tells us how to do that. So let's just kind of wrap our minds around this, make sure that it's hopefully just connecting with you. And if you're paying attention, if you're with me so far, let me just kind of reinforce. What he's basically saying is since the first part of verse 4 is true, since we're going to overcome, since there's no doubt about it that every single Christian, each and every one who is a follower of Jesus, everyone who is born of God, we overcome. And since that's true of every Christian, well, then we can overcome now. We can overcome now. We can have that victory present in our world. Now, this is important. I tried to share this in first service, and I think it landed, but I'm not positive. So God, give me help to say this really, really well, because it's important that you don't get this wrong. These two realities of overcoming are connected, and yet they are also disconnected. When we think about overcoming in eternity, and we think about overcoming today, there's a connection that one can just feed the other, but they don't always do that in life saying it differently, that in one sense, as we think about what this is like, when we think about overcoming now, that doesn't mean if we overcome today that we will overcome in eternity. Today is not earning for us that reality. Instead, it's coming the other direction. He's saying, you're going to overcome. That's not a doubt. That's not a question. That's not a maybe. That's not an if. That's absolutely solid. But because that's true, this can be true. Because that's solid, you can over enjoy overcoming today. We can enter into this space of, of being able to live our lives as overcomers. Now, maybe we do. Maybe we do. Maybe we don't. Maybe we struggle. Maybe we have questions. It doesn't change the end of the story. It doesn't change the end of the story. Our failure here isn't going to change that. That's solid, but he's inviting us because that's solid that we can have this now, that we can have this incredible space of doing that. So how do we do it? I mean, if that's what we could, if we could enjoy some of what's true in eternity into this moment, how do we get there? Well, he gives it to us very simply. You saw it, right? But see it again. End of verse four. And this is the victory. This is how we overcome. This is how we enjoy overcoming now. The victory that is ours when we overcome the world is faith. It is our faith. That faith becomes the key. Faith becomes the thing that unlocks it, unpacks it, works it into our lives. And wow. Really, really good news. Um, so much I can say. Let me try to say a couple things really fast. The only way to get saved is by faith. Nobody can earn salvation there is no other way. I like the way it says it in, in Ephesians 2 that, you know, it's not by our works that we, we earn this. For faith comes by, he, this faith comes from us believing. 
It's not what we do. It's, it, it's this by grace through faith that we recognize this. Paul talks about it in Romans, that it's not by the works of the law, but by believing in Jesus. Now, here's what I know. If you're born again, you did that. You believed. You heard about Jesus. You heard the gospel, and you placed your faith in Jesus, and you were saved. That's the way it happens. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, then we're inviting you to that. We're inviting you to the simple reality of John 3.16, that God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. If you would believe in Jesus, if you would place your, your, your faith in him, that opens up everything. That draws you into life in Christ. And if that is you this morning, we're inviting you to that. That said, faith is not just the beginning of our journey. Faith is how we live everything out. And when we talk about faith here in this part of this verse, we're not talking about the faith that opens the door for us necessarily, though it starts there. We're talking about the faith that holds us today. We're talking about the faith that is that. And when I think about that, I love the definition that's given to us in Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews 11, 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. This is a great verse. Here's the problem. For many of you, like your Bible people, like you've heard this, and so you hear this, and you're like, and it just kind of washes over you like a warm fuzzy, and you're not actually paying attention. It's this really almost funny way of saying it. It's evidence that you can't see. Just go and try that sometime. Like, like go into a courtroom and say, you know, hey, judge, I have evidence, but I can't show it to you. <laughs> I, I have evidence that I'm going to prove to you where I am. It's just invisible. You'd be like, oh, great, thank you. Um, you're dismissed. You know, it's like, you know, end of the story. You know, we, we're here for, we want evidence that can be seen. But faith is not that. Faith is not what you can see, it's what you cannot see. It is substance, it is substantial, it is strength, it is a reality of things that are there. It is hope, but you cannot see it. Paul would talk about it in Corinthians and says, you know, we walk by, by, by faith and not by sight. If you could understand it, if you could see it, if you could understand all that God is doing, you don't need faith. If you don't understand, and you don't know why, and you don't know when, and you don't know what God, faith is required to gain that which you cannot fathom. It goes on there in, in Hebrews 11, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So you want to please God, you want to walk in his ways, you're going to have to have faith. Faith means you believe God is God. There is a God, I believe it, and he's at work. And he rewards those who believe. If we believe, if we trust in him, he works, even though we can't see it. That's the reality that's being held out to us. And that, that's the reality that's found all the way through Scripture. If you don't know Hebrews 11, it might be worth going back and reading the entire chapter of Hebrews 11. It's often called the Hall of Faith. Is in many ways, just the writer of Hebrews just takes us on this journey of seeing all these people who did amazing things in history whether it was Moses being led, you know, leading the children of Israel out of, uh, you know, through the Red Sea, or Joshua taking you know, down the city of Jericho, whether it was you know, any of those who did this. He says, how did they do that? How did anybody see what God wanted to do in the world? He says, they believed him. It was by faith. And it just says it over and over. By faith, by faith, by faith, these who believed, these who walked in that, believed God, and God began to draw them into everything that he had for them. So he's telling us right now that's where we need to be. That, you know, as we think about wanting to experience God's overcoming help to live as an overcomer today, the key to that, the thing that unlocks that, makes it possible today, is believing him. It's having faith in him. Having faith in, in, in what he has for us. Now maybe again, all by itself, I've just said it, and you're like, Jim, I totally get that. We can go on. But I don't know about anybody else, but sometimes I almost need to see this. I mean, in one sense, I'm thinking, okay, I think I understand what we just talked about. I'm not sure. And so I love to see this kind of illustrated in ways in the Bible. And one of the ways it's illustrated is an encounter that Jesus orchestrates for his followers. Now, in many ways, it unpacks both of these. So I'm going to bring down the first principle that we already saw on the screen. This idea of believing that everyone who is born of God will overcome. And since that's over true, that's true, we can overcome. 
The encounter I want to draw your attention to is the time that Jesus orchestrates for his disciples to get in a boat and go across the Sea of Galilee. Maybe you know it. It's recorded for us in the gospel several places, but I want to give you the one in Mark chapter 4. I'll put it up on the screen so you don't need to turn there. You're welcome to if you want to. Let's just notice this. It begins there in chapter 4, verse 35. It says, On that same day when evening had come, he, that is Jesus, said to them, that is the disciples, and said, let us cross over to the other side. Now, I don't want to make this too, like, pressing it outside of what it says. I just want you to notice the word over for a moment. And because we're talking about overcoming, right? I mean, we're talking about overcoming, and I just really feel that there is this kind of connection here because he looks at the disciples and says, let's go over. We're going to go over to the other side. I'm gonna, we're going to get in a boat, and we're going to make it over to the other side. He spoke that to them. It could be something they would hear and understand. Well, it goes on. It says, now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. So some fun context. I'll leave that for another time. And then it lets us know. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves beat into the boat. So there was already filling. I mean, they get out there, and, and, and the waves begin to come. It becomes this huge storm. The boat sink, begins to sink, and it tells us that he was in the stern. Jesus, he's asleep on a pillow. And they, the disciples, awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus responds to them. says he arose, and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Oh, may God do that, longing for that. He does this, he causes the storm to go away in a moment, but then he just says to them, why were you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Why did, why did you allow that to, to, to bring you into such dread? You could have had faith. Well, he does that. They feared exceedingly, it tells us, of the disciples, and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? I mean, they're just, wow, you know, Ed, who Jesus is. But the next verse just simply tells us, then they came to the other side of the sea. Just hear that for a moment. They, 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 they got to the other side. Jesus said they were going to get there. They do. So we back up to this, and maybe again this is clear. And maybe this will really work for you, but I want to invite you to it. I'd like you to try to picture it. If you have a good imagination, you're already there. If you don't, hey, work at it for a moment. <laughs> I just want you to think about it. I want you to try to just fly above this, like you're a drone, you know, kind of thing, flying around this, this thing, and you're watching all of this take place. You're, you're watching what's happening, and, and you watch the disciples get into the boat, and they get into the boat, and then it begins to go crazy. The wind probably begins to pick up. The boat begins to rock a little bit. And then all of a sudden, it becomes what the text tells us is a great windstorm. I don't know if you've ever been in a great windstorm where all of a sudden, you know, it's not just a gentle breeze any longer. It's now become destructive. I mean, it's now become scary. The wind is, is, is raking across them. And then the waves begin to come. Wave after wave after wave. And the, they begin to splash into the boat. And the boat begins to fill. Now, they are surely, you know, scooping everything they can out of the boat, but it's filling up faster than they can do so. And the boat begins to sink. The boat begins to go down. And you watch this. And you watch this moment. And you think about how, how, how crazy that would feel. And then he just gives us this image that we fast forward a little bit further along that image. And we're looking into that boat. And in the back of the boat, in the stern, there's Jesus. And he's knocked out. I mean, he's got a pillow there, and he's asleep. I mean, he is just, you know, resting and, and sleeping, and he's totally doing well. But then you gaze to the rest of the boat, and nobody else is sleeping. In fact, they are panicking. Now, it's worth noting, by the way, that for many of these disciples, these are fishermen. Peter, James, John, Andrew... They have spent their life on this sea. They are fishermen who have, you know, endured so many things on this sea. And I just want to tell you, if they're panicking, it's worthy of panic. 
You know what I mean, right? I mean, you ever been there, you've been on a plane, and, and you have somebody who's like their first time flying, and they're kind of panicking about everything, and not, not making fun of anybody here, um, but you know what I mean by that? And, you, and, and one of the things you can often tell them is like, watch the stewardess. If they don't panic, don't panic. Now, if they panic, go ahead and panic. You know, it's like, you know, and if, if, if they, I mean, they do it all the time. They know what they're talking, I mean, you know, but if, if they're like, oh, this is, we, we, we've been through this a hundred times, you know, we're good. But the moment they come unglued, then it's a serious deal. Well, the disciples come unglued. This is a huge storm. This is big. This is, this is bigger than, than, than they're used to. They're absolutely panicking. But here's the question that I want to ask you first of all. I think about things that we're talking about. So our first principle is, <clears throat> that every single Christian who is a Christian, they're going to overcome. So, simple question, how many of the disciples who got into that boat make it to the other side? All of them. All of them. There wasn't one that was left. Jesus said, we're going over. And they went over. They went over. Not anybody was left. And here's what I want to tell you. True for them, true for you. I like the way Jesus prayed it when he talks about his high priestly prayer. He's praying to God in uh, John 17. He says, Father, I have not lost one. I have not lost one. And I can tell you that's true then. It's true into eternity. We're not, there's not going to be anybody when we get to heaven. It's like, well, 95% of us made it. You know, I had some, but a couple. You know, big windstorm, they went over. Sorry. You know, just like I lost them, you know, kind of deal. I just want you to understand, not our Savior, not our God who promises us that if we're in his hand, nothing can snatch us out of his hand. Here's the thing. We're going to make it. Everyone who is in his, who, who is of Christ, that the, the thing that we can know absolutely solidly is we're going to get to the other side. We're going to get there that whatever is happening in the midst of that, it's not where our story ends. It's not that we get there, but see, that's what happens sometimes. We get into the midst of the storm, and we just begin feeling like, oh, this is it. This is the end. I mean, I mean everything's done. Instead of thinking, okay, I don't know how this is going to go. I mean, if the worst happens and, and I die, then I'm with Jesus. I mean, but it, it, you know, many times, not even, I mean, I can't be lost. I can't, I can't have anything lose me. I, I, can't, I, can't, I, I am one that I could look at this and say, I don't know how this is going to play out, but I know where it ends. I know what's happening. That would be incredibly powerful. And I'm inviting you to see this and saying, okay, if you could have known that, if they could have known that, if they could have believed that Jesus said we're going over and they knew they were going over, that would have been good, but they didn't. Instead, they panicked. They absolutely panic. And so, again, I'm just inviting you to kind of fly over this in your mind and watching this, and as clear as you can, just seeing it. Over here, we see Jesus. He's, a, he's in the boat. He's asleep on a pillow, and the disciples are panicking. I mean, they're coming unglued, so much so that they wake Jesus up, right? We read it, but notice it again, you know, that they look at this whole thing. He's a stern asleep on the pillow, and they wake him up, and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Did you notice what they ask? It's worth just making sure you get good attention to it. They didn't say, don't you know that we're perishing? Somehow already they've begun to understand. You know, it's, it's not like they're going to wake up Jesus. Like, Jesus, you surely, like, you don't know. Instead, they begin to ask the question that is far more common. Probably most of us have asked this kind of question in the midst of a storm. God, don't you care about me? Don't you care? How could you let me go through this? Do you love me? God, do, do, do you not care? Do you not understand? Like, how could you do this to us? Don't you, don't you understand? I mean, they are this moment are unglued, but they are, not only are they confused because they're afraid of the storm, they, they don't understand why God would allow it, and they find themselves asking this question. Jesus steps into it. He rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, peace be still, and the wind ceased. And where there was a great windstorm, now there's a great calm. Oh, may God do that. I mean, some of us, are, you, know, you know it, you feel like you're in the midst of a storm right now. May God just speak it. May he bring us into a great calm. He does that. He can do it. I love that. But now he gives us the instruction. He just looked at the disciples and he said to them, why? Why did you give in to fear? Why did you panic? How is it that you have no faith? 
here's the instruction. Here's that space where he's giving us what we're talking about in our text this morning, right? So how do we experience victory today? If we are going to be victorious then, how do we know it now? We believe. What could they have believed? They could have believed that Jesus meant what he said. He said, we're going over to the other side. They could have believed that. That would have been good. But, you know, they had more. They had Jesus with them. I mean, you know, I mean, it is, is that they could have just looked over and thought, well, you know, he's right there. <laughs> like, if, if he's with us, the boat can't go down. You know, if he's with us, you know, we're going to make it. They could have believed that. They could have just believed even in God and just trusting him because that's what they began to question. They began to ask, don't you care? Don't you love me? Don't you, war-? and, and, but they could have believed even in the midst of that. And that's where God is inviting us. He's inviting you and I to see that, uh, to be in the midst of it so that we would be able to do this. And maybe again, this makes perfect sense, but as much as I can say it, I want you to see this and then see how diametrically opposed these are. Jesus is resting. He's able to go to sleep. They're panicking. So how is it that you and I do storms? I mean, here's the honest reality. Some of you can live in one of these extremes. Most of us live somewhere in between. You know, maybe we're not full-on panicking, but we're not able just to rest. We're not able to be like, I'm just going to take a nap. Like, it's, you know, I, I'm good. You know, I don't have any stress or worry. I don't know about you. I know for me, even in the season that I'm walking through right now, that's where I am, and I see it, though. It's like, I, I'd, I'd like to move closer over here. I'd like to move closer to this place of saying, I am resting. I I can rest. I I can trust. I can trust a God that, you know, I can have faith, not because I understand, but because I trust him. That's what he's inviting us to be. That's what he's inviting us to do. That's what he's telling us we can do. The lesson is inviting us to faith. Now, I love that he does this, and if he only did this once, it would be enough. But our God, he offers remedial classes. Uh, For those who, who don't learn the lesson the first time, Um, he will sometimes let you go through it again. And so kind of a deja vu experience, it happens all over, right? We get through this incredible storm. You think, okay, that's enough. We're learning the lesson. We're going to apply it. It's probably about a year later. They're in the feeding of the 5,000. They get to the end of the feeding of the 5,000. In Matthew's gospel, it tells us then immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Why he sent the disciples away. I mean, it should have been it's a little like, okay, you guys get in the boat, go to the other side. Like, you're just going to go to the other side. He sends the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray, and now when evening came, he was there alone. So there's some similarities, right? Deja vu, disciples, boat, sea, you know, out there in the midst of it. There's some changes, though. Maybe the big change is that Jesus isn't with them this time, and I, I think that's significant. I don't want to, again, press it too hard, but I think there's a double lesson for us. In the first storm incident, it was a reminder that God is always with us. And I can tell you that. I can tell you that God has told us he would never leave us or forsake us. I believe that. In the midst of our storm, he is there. But you know what we see in the second storm? Not only is God that one who's with us, Jesus goes up on the mountain and he looks down at them and praying, and that's a foreshadow of what Jesus is doing now. It tells us in the book of Hebrews that our Jesus is our great high priest who is ever before the right hand of the Father, and he's praying for us. He just looks, he sees us in the midst of our life, and he's praying. So I I know he's doing that. So he's doing that for them. They're in the midst of it, but this time again, it happens. The storm begins to happen. The boat is in the middle of the sea, and now the waves are hitting, constantly beginning to move this whole thing. The boat is moving up and down in the waves. It's contrary to them. And again, it should have just wonder, like, okay, we've done this before. So Jesus comes to them. And the fourth watch of the night, about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they are troubled, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. Now, again, kind of funny. I mean, again, you just got to almost imagine this for a moment. You got to be that drone flying over. Jesus does the miraculous. He does the impossible. He is walking right up to him. But they're in the middle of a storm. And in the midst of it, fear is beginning to rise in their hearts. So now they see Jesus And they just make this crazy assumption, like, it's a ghost, you know, kind of thing. Without going any deeper in that to us this morning, that's not real. Ghosts aren't real. That's not how things work. That's not, you know, all of that is either demonic or it's in our own imaginations, and that's where they are. 
But they begin to believe what they cannot see. They begin to just give in to fear. They begin to give in to these things. And they're like, ah, you know, you know, now they're doubly afraid because of what's before them. Well, Jesus speaks to them. And he just says, be of good cheer. It's I. Do not be afraid. Wonderful words. Just Jesus, like, don't do that. Don't be afraid. It's me. You know, like, I'm right with you in the midst of this. And we don't know how that processed. I'd like to think that just an immediate peace came over most of them, and maybe it did. It doesn't tell us that, but we do know how one of them responds. You guys know the story, right? Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, if this is really you talking to me, command me to come out to you on the water. You, you tell me to come. Like, if this is you and you're really in this moment, tell me to do this. And Jesus just told him, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Okay, pause. I know this. I know that probably everybody in this room, you know the rest of the story, and you're like, I know what's going to happen next. They're like, I know where this is going to go, and I know what's going to happen next, but don't miss this. He's the only one that did. He's the only one that did. Peter literally believes in Jesus, trusts him enough to step out of the boat in the midst of a storm and walk on the water. How long did he walk? I don't know. Was it five seconds? Maybe <laughs> Maybe it lasted for a minute. Maybe, maybe it lasted for two or three minutes. And, and Peter's just walking out there, doing the miraculous, trusting in Jesus, begins making his way to Jesus. And again, we can find fault in what's about to happen, but he's the only one that gets this far. But it tells us when he, Peter, saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. So he begins to go under, like he's just like, ah, you know, he, he, he takes his eyes off of Jesus, stops believing, starts fearing, and now he's not doing so well. Now he begins to go under the waves, and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, and said to him, oh, you have little faith, why did you doubt? Uh, why did you doubt? So he says it one more time, same lesson, same lesson, lesson number one back in, in Mark 4 and given to us also in Matthew, he says, you didn't have to do that. You could have had faith. Why did you not trust you? Why did you give in to fear? Now, I don't know how you hear this. Again, we don't have tone. I don't take this as, you know, Jesus being harsh. Like, you dummy. You know, like, can't believe you did that. I, I kind of take it as a general. Like, you didn't have to do that. You could have had faith. You know, you didn't have to give in. You didn't have to, you didn't have to panic. You could have, why, why didn't you just trust me? Why didn't you just believe in me? And it was the lesson that now Jesus repeats a second time. And, and it's the lesson that maybe we are needing to hear now. That he's telling us, hey, you know, here's what's possible for you. Here's what's possible. You know, you could be in the midst of a storm, in the midst of what you don't know how it's going to work out, how it's, how, how it's going to happen, but you could trust him. You could have faith. You could have faith in the midst of that. That's the way it can be done. That's what he's telling us here in, in 1 John. He says, you know, here's the deal. You're going to overcome. The world's not going to win. You're going to get to the other side. End of story. But you can enjoy that now. Now, I don't know if the disciples learned the lesson really, really well. It was never repeated as far as we know. But if we were to only take what we've seen so far, we'd have to say, the stats on those who handled the storm well are pretty low. You know, in the first one, it was like zero. In the second one, it was like one. Now, I hope that's not necessarily the stats today, but it's enough gracious to say, well, it, maybe it's more that we need to see that than we don't. Maybe there's comfort in recognizing you, we're not the only ones that do that. But there is a, a place where he would look at us and say, you know, you can go through storms one of two ways. You're going to make it. You're going to get to heaven. The world is not going to win. But you kind of have a choice. You could be like Jesus and resting, taking a nap, or you can panic. You know? and, and there is a place of saying, you know what? I, I would like to do better. How do I get over here? How do I become one that doesn't give in to fear, doesn't you know, go under the waves and, and, and start questioning God's character? It's faith. It's believing God, saying, God, I, I know there is a God. I know he's good. I know he's trustworthy. I don't know what he's doing here, 
I don't know why he's allowing this to happen, but I know he cares about me. And he says, if you could do that, you could, you could be more that way. And so the invitation to us this morning is that is possible. I mean, it's not meant to be kind of ac- accusatory to any of us this morning, but it is possible to say we could, we could grow in this. We could be more of those who would have that. And he's giving us that this morning, saying that since we are going to overcome, we can overcome. Well, there's one other nugget, though, that's going to help us. One other piece of this that we've seen. So we've talked about overcoming. We are going to overcome. We can overcome because we're going to overcome. And he gives us one other thing. Notice with me there in verse 5. And he asks the question that we began with a moment ago. So who is he who overcomes the world? Answer, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Who is the one who's going to overcome the world? Well, Jesus is the one that overcame. And our believing in him is what brings that to pass in our lives. Who overcomes? Who is the one that does that? It's the one, he says, who believes in Jesus. The one who does that. The one who places his faith because, one more time, Jesus did. Jesus overcame. He is here. He tells us he's the son of God. He's the one, God, who humbled himself, became flesh, died on the cross to pay the price for our sin, rose from the grave as the the one who overcame everything. And the idea is here is that because he's the one that did that, as we believe upon him, we overcome. Now, that's technically very, very true, but it's practically powerful. How so? Because the idea is not focusing on us. It's not who we are. It's not what we're doing. We don't earn overcoming. It's not that we've done really, really well. It's who he is and what he's done that gives us the power to overcome. And again, this is so helpful and it's so hopeful because here's the deal. I'm inviting you to this place of saying, hey, you can overcome by believing in Jesus. And the problem is immediately we begin to look at that and think, if only I were a better person. If only I were a better person, I could have that. You know, if only I'd read the whole Bible through or read it through 10 times, or, you know, if I was really a good person, maybe I'd have that. And we have this propensity to begin to focus on ourselves and feel unworthy and feel like, well, that's not, you know, (laughs) that's good for some people. It's not really good for me. But he's saying, no, take your eyes off of you and see him. See Jesus. See that he is the one that overcame. And it's because he overcame that you can enjoy that. Not because of who you are, what you've done, but because of who he is and what he has done. I think about it this way. Jesus would speak it. Just give you a few examples. I could give you many more. In John 16, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome. I have won, Jesus says. Because I overcame, you can have peace. Because I'm the one who is this, you can find peace. Yes, the world is hard. Yes, it's going to be hard. But look at me, Jesus says. I beat it. I have overcome that. And if you believe that, you can have peace. Wow. So it's focusing on him, not on us. I think about it this way in Romans 8. It says, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That word conquerors is the word nakao. And this is the idea of overcoming. We are more than overcomers. We, we, we are more than those who, who, who conquer because of Jesus. You know, the whole passage there in Romans 8 is like, so what could separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Like we can't be, we, we don't just win, we win. I mean, we're not just going to win, we are going to so win. We are more than overcomers. We are those who are going to get there. Why? Because of him. And all these things, we are conquerors through him who loved us. It's who he is and what he's done. Thessalonians, I'm sorry, Corinthians would give it to us this way. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. That's the word overcoming or nakao. He gives us victory through Jesus. It's not you, it's him. It's not what you're doing, it's what he did that is our source of victory. And believing in that, finding our hope in that is what secures that for us. David Guzik says it maybe a tiny bit different if it lands for somebody. He says, this tells us we overcome because of who we are in Christ, because of what we do. 
We overcome because we are born of God, and we are born of God because we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It's not what we are. It's what he's done, and that's what gives us this hope. That's what works this for us. That's what brings it into reality so that you and I can have this. And he's inviting us to it. So I already began to unpack it for you. I told you, right, at the end of our service, in just a few minutes, uh, we're going to sing a new song that Shane and Shane put together this year, uh, kind of talking about it. In the midst of that song, it's going to be singing it. So I'm just, I want you to sing it when we sing it, but I just want you to hear a couple of the words right now. He says, there's a peace that outlasts darkness. There's hope that's in the blood, you know, in because of what Christ has done for us. He says, there's future grace that we're going to win, but it's mine today. It's mine today because Jesus won. That, that I can have that, that future grace that's going to be mine in heaven. I can enjoy it because Jesus has already won. I'm fighting a battle we're going to sing in a moment that you've already won. No matter what comes my way, I will overcome. What an incredible reality. Just saying the same thing that I've been trying to say all morning. Are you in the middle of a battle? Are you in the midst of a storm? He already won. There is no doubt to the end of the story. It's not going to win. Whatever you're going through doesn't win. That wins. We're fighting a battle that we, he's already won. No matter what happens in the midst of this, we're already going to win. I don't know what you're doing, it'll say in the song, but I know what you've done. I don't know what this is, but I know what you accomplished on the cross. I know that security, eternity for me. I'm fighting a battle today. But it's a va- battle I know we win. It's a battle I know where we're going in this, and what incredible hope there is there. What a space to be able to believe that and say, hey, that's how we have that. It is. So this morning, three things that are being unpacked for us in overcoming. We are going to overcome. We can enjoy overcoming today, and both of those are found in Christ. He's our hope. He's our help. He's our salvation. He's the one that has that. I don't know where that is for you this morning. I don't know where that lands for you. I don't know what's a part of that this morning, but I'm inviting you to it. Maybe you're right in the midst of the battle right now. Maybe you're right in the middle of the storm. You have those difficulties, and you just need to believe it, that we win. And we can enjoy it today. But we focus on Jesus to get there. If you don't know Jesus, it's a good place for me to invite you to him and say, hey, that's the only place this would be found. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a few moments, and we're going to close taking communion this morning. If you have a Bible or notebook open, you might want to go ahead and close that as we want to enter into a time where we take communion. We, we take communion you know, you know, throughout the month, usually twice a month, once on Wednesday, once on Sunday. Second uh, week of the month, we do it on Sunday morning, which is today. So it just times out, it's a great space for us to do this because we just talked about it, right? The key to our overcoming is to see what Jesus has done. That's what's celebrated in communion. Jesus gave us communion so that we would focus on what he accomplished on the cross that he literally won. So before we sing the song that I've already been introducing to you this morning, we're going to sing another song uh, that is well known to us that will begin to move us into the space and we'll sing the song as we pass out communion. But we're going to sing the, the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And some of you would recognize it's saying the same reality. Horatius Spafford writes this song in the midst of an incredibly difficult time, losing huge financial losses, trials and tribulation, losing two of his daughters in the midst of a shipwreck. He sits down and writes this song that just simply says, you know, that it's well with his soul. It says, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord on my soul. He's able to look into this and say, I can go through this. I can, I, can, I, can, I can go through this trial and say, I've won because of what he's done. I, I know that. I have that reality. So as we head towards taking communion again, maybe you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, I just want to tell you that communion really is a celebration for believers to celebrate what he is to us. If you don't know Jesus, this is maybe a time that you just let communion pass you by. Don't take that. Or, better opportunity, give your life to Jesus now. Maybe you woke up this day and you knew it. You came to church and you're like, okay, I'm coming to church because it's time to surrender. Do it now. Do it in this space. Communion would be a great place to surrender your life to him. Paul tells us every time we take communion, we're proclaiming the gospel. 
We're saying, hey, this is who we are. It's Jesus that saves us. And so if that's you this morning, surrender your life to him. If you're a follower of Jesus, if this is your church, or even if you're just visiting us and and you're a follower of Jesus, you're invited to take communion with us because we have this together in Christ. But in the midst of it, I'm inviting you to fix your eyes on him, to say, we've already overcome. We've already won, not because of what I am, but because of what he is, what he's done. So I'm going to take a moment and pray for us, ask God to draw us into that. Then when I'm done praying, the worship team is going to lead us in a song, uh, This Well With My Soul. At that moment, the ushers and greeters are going to pass out the communion elements. There are two cups stacked together. Take both cups, uh, hold them. The, the bottom cup has the bread. The top cup has the juice. Hang on to them. At the end of singing that song, we'll take communion together. Let's pray for it right now. Father, I thank you right now as we enter into this space of being able to recognize Jesus, you. I begin by praying for any here that don't know you, and for them to come to know you. There's no other hope. There's no other way. God, would you cause them to be born again? Would you cause these that don't know you to believe upon you and be saved? Today, would you draw them? I leave them in your care and now bring before you my brothers and sisters. God, and I know this. I know there's hope today. I know there's help today. I know there's a space of being able to enjoy the reality that our soul is well. Not because of who we are, but Jesus, because of who you are. So right now, as we begin to take communion, would you help us in that? Would you help us to fix our eyes on you? To fix our eyes on you, who is the one who has overcome. Help us to see that. To that end, anything that's holding us back, just would you wash us? Would you cleanse us? Sin that would just be robbing us of this connection right now, would you graciously deal with that? And then draw us into a space where our focus would be on you, Jesus. Would you make that possible and real for us right here and right now? Would you work this in us, we pray in Jesus' name.